Assalamu alaikum class. Today we will continue our discussion on Mendelian genetics. Going to talk about the tri hybrid cross, which is also called the three factor cross. First of all, the learning objective of today's class. So, the objective of today's session is to use the probability or the fault line method to calculate the chances of any particular genotype arising from a genetic cross. Let's just quickly recall the law of independent assortment. You all know that the law states that during gamete formation, segregating pairs of unit factors, which are the genes, assort independently of each other. Mendel's law of independent assortment states that genes do not influence each other with regard to the sorting of alleles into gametes. Every possible combination of the alleles for every gene is equally likely to occur. The independent assortment of the gene can be illustrated by the help of a dihybrid cross, which is a cross between two true breeding parents that express different traits for two characteristics. Here in the Punnett square, you can see a yellow round seed, which is being crossed with the wrinkled green seed. Here, capital Y and capital Y are the alleles for the yellow seed color. And you know that this is the dominant allele and the genes. Small y, small y are the recessive alleles for the green seed color. Similarly, capital R, capital R are actually representing the alleles for the round dominant seed shape. And small r, small r are the alleles for the wrinkled seed shape. And you all know that it is the um, recessive allele. Now consider the characteristics of the seed color and seed texture for two pea plants. One that has green wrinkled seeds with the, the genotype of small y, small y and small r, small r. And another that has yellow round seeds and the genotype is going to be capital Y, capital Y, capital R and capital R. Because each of the parent is homozygous, the law of segregation indicates that the gamut for the green or wrinkled plant are all they are going to be small y and small r, while the gametes for the yellow round plants are going to be all capital Y and the capital R. Therefore, the F and generation of the, all the offsprings are going to be capital Y, small y, capital R, and a small r. For the F2 generation, the law of segregation requires that each gamete receives either an allele capital R or a small r allele along with either the allele capital Y or a small y allele. The law of independent assortment states that a gamete into which an allele, a small r allele sorted would be equally likely to contain either an allele capital Y or small y. Thus, there are four equally likely gametes that can be formed when the capital Y, small y, capital R and a small r heterozygote is self-crossed. When we self-cross that and we arrange them, arranging these gametes along the top and left of the Punnett square, as you can see, which is a 4 by 4 Punnett square, it gives us about 16 equally likely genotypic combination. And from these genotypes, we infer a phenotypic ratio of 9 round and yellow, 3 round and green, 3 wrinkled and yellow, and 1 wrinkled and green. These are all the offsprings ratio we would expect, assuming we perform the crosses with the large enough sample size. Because of independent assortment of the dominance and the dominance, the 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1, Dihybrid uh, phenotypic ratio can be collapsed into like uh, two three to one ratios characteristics of any monohybrid cross that follows a dominant and recessive pattern. Ignoring seed color and considering only seed texture in the above dihybrid cross, uh, we would expect that three quarters of the F2 generation of springs would be round and one quarter would be wrinkled. Similarly, isolating only seed color, we would assume that three quarters of the F2 generation of the F2 offsprings would be yellow and one quarter would be green. The sorting of the alleles for texture and color are independent events, so we can apply the product rule. Therefore, the proportion of the round and yellow in F2 offspring is expected to be 
थ्री पर फोर इंटू थ्री पर फोर विच इज इक्वल टू लाइक नाइन पर सिक्सटीन टोटल ऑफ स्प्रिंग एंड द प्रोपोर्शन ऑफ द रिंग किल्ड एंड द ग्रीन ऑफ स्प्रिंग इज एक्सपेक्टेड टू बी वन बाय फोर्थ एंड वन बाय फोर्थ विच इज इक्वल टू वन बाय सिक्सटीन Now these proportions are identical to those obtained using a Punnett square. Round green and wrinkled yellow offspring can also be calculated using the product rule, as each of these genotypes include one dominant and one recessive phenotype. Therefore, the proportion of each is calculated as like three per four into one by four, which is equal to three per sixteen total offsprings. Now let's talk about the tie hybrid cross and how we represent it. When more than two genes are being considered, the Punnett square method becomes unwieldy. For instance, examining a cross involving four genes would require a 16 into 16 grid containing like around um, 256 boxes. It would be extremely cumbersome to manually enter each genotype. For more complex uh, crosses, the fork line and probability method are preferred. Now, to prepare a fork line diagram for a cross between F1 heterozygotes resulting from a cross between uh, uh, two true breeding plants, for example, uh, which have genes, uh, just consider three uh, genes: uh, one dominant gene, which is being represented by capital A, capital A; uh, the second gene represented by B; and the third represented by C. And the capital letters are actually representing the uh, dominant genotype, and the small ones are representing the recessive genotype pattern. So first, we create rows equal to the number of genes being considered, and then segregate the alleles in each row on a fork line according to the probabilities for individual monohybrid crosses. And then we are going to multiply the values along each fork path to obtain the F2 offspring probabilities. Now note that this process is a diagrammatic version of the product rule, and the values along each fork pathway can be multiplied because each gene assorts independently. And similarly, for our trihybrid cross, the FT phenotype ratio is going to be um, uh, like 27 is to 9 is to 9 is to 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1. Now, how we do that? Let's just do it practically. So let's start with the two heterozygotes. Uh, these two heterozygotes have uh, uh, three genes. Uh, let's just consider them as gene one, two, and three. One is being represented by capital A and small a. The other one is represented by B, and the third gene is represented by uh, C. And uh, you see, capital A and small a, they are present in uh, uh, in two different heterozygotes, and each heterozygote contains uh, a dominant allele and do and a recessive allele. So first, we prepare a monohybrid cross, a simple Punnett square. And you see, we are putting the alleles on the both sides, uh, the capital A and small a, and then we are like multiply them, and we are able to prepare the Punnett square for that. And in this, you can see that one fourth of the progenies would be capital A, capital A. Two fourth are going to be capital A, small a, and one fourth of these progenies are going to be homozygous recessive, uh, small a and small a. Now let's consider the um, Uh, second gene, which is B, and uh, in the second gene, you see uh, the first uh, parent is small b, small b, and the other one is uh, heterozygote, which is uh, capital B and small b. We prepare the Punnett square exactly in the same way. We will have like two fourths, which are going to be capital B and small b, and two fourths are going to be homozygous recessive with small b, small b. Now for the third gene, which is being represented by C. Uh, first one, capital C, capital C, which is being crossed with two recessive ones, and we see that the ratio of the heterozygotes is going to be four by four. All of them are going to be uh, capital C and small c. Now, uh, let's see that for these uh, three genes which are present in the two heterozygotes, we are going to prepare the uh, fork. For this fork, first of all, we consider that one fourth of the progenies are Uh, homozygous dominant, and in uh, the second we have two fourths, which are capital A and small a. In the in and in third one, we have small a, small a in a ratio of one fourth. And you see, uh, when we cross it or compare it with the uh, second gene, 
we will see that in combination with one fourth of capital A and capital A, we have two by fourth of capital B and small b. Similarly, we can have after multiplying the first gene with the second Punnett square, we will have two fourths which are going to be small b, small b. We do the same with the, the uh, other combination of gene one. And you see the number of uh, progenies that we have in uh, three forks that are being generated. So now what we do, we are going to like see, uh, make the same type of combination for the third gene, which is gene C. So with the first combination of one fourth of capital A, capital A and uh, capital B and small b, we will have four by four, capital C, small c, and it's going to be the same for all other uh, combinations. After doing that, what we are going to do, we are going to multiply the uh, ratio part. So for uh, the uh, first combination, you see we have one fourth, which are capital A, capital A, two fourth are capital B and small b, and four by four are capital C, small c. So first we multiply the, uh, the um, uh, upper values, which are so you multiply one with two with four, and this is equal to total eight progenies out of total 64. The 64 we calculated by multiplying the one, uh, the four number with four, four and four, which is equal to 64. So we will have a total eight progenies out of 64, which will have a genotype of capital A, capital A, capital B, small b, capital C and small c. We are going to do the same with the, the other ones and you see that 8 by 64 in the second combination is going to be capital A, capital A, small b, small b, capital C and small c. We are going to do the same thing. We are going to multiply the numerator and the denominators for each combination and we see that in the second combination we have 16 per 64 which have a genotype of capital A, small a, capital B, small b capital C and small c and that's a like perfect um, heterozygote and it has all the combinations of genes you see and we are then going to do uh, the same thing with the, the uh, third type of combination and you see that I'm just doing to make this uh, um, uh, fork I'm just trying to I'm just doing multiplying the numerators and the denominators and at the end we are able to see that out of total 64 progenies, how many of the progenies are homozygotes, how, how many of them are heterozygotes and how many of them have which combination of genes. So the main key takeaways from this part of the video is that Mendel's law of independent sorting states that the genes do not influence each other with regard to the sorting of the alleles into gametes. Every possible combination of allele for every gene is like equally likely to occur. The second main point is that the calculation of any particular genotype combination of more than one gene is therefore the probability of desired genotype at the first locus multiplied by the probability of the desired genotype at that loci. Loci is the location where a gene is present. And the last thing, the fork line method can be used to calculate the chances of all possible genotypic combinations from a cross like we did previously. And while the probability method can be used to calculate the chances of any one particular genotype that might result from that cross. Now, keeping the law of independent assortment and the law of segregation, which was proposed by Mandel, uh, we are going to look at the chromosomal theory of inheritance, which was put forth by these three famous people. Actually, it was put forth by Walter Sutton and Theodore Bouveri, but uh, Morgan provided the uh, experimental evidence for like proving it, although he was one of the main critique for uh, this uh, chromosomal theory of inheritance. He didn't believe into that, but Later, he did some experiments and then uh, he proved himself like wrong and the chromosomal theory of inheritance was true for, well, it's true for um, everything that we know about genetics. So, the chromosomal theory of inheritance. 
the speculation is that chromosomes might be the key to understanding um, heredity led several scientists to examine Mendel's publication and re-evaluate his model in terms of the behavior of chromosomes during the meiosis and mitosis. In 1902, uh, Theodore Bivori uh, observed that the uh, proper embryonic development of uh, sea urchins does not occur unless chromosomes are present. In the same year, Walter Sutton observed the separation of chromosomes into daughter cells during meiosis. Together, these observations led to the development of the chromosomal theory of inheritance, which identified chromosomes as the genetic material responsible for the Mendelian inheritance. Now, despite compelling correlations between the behavior of chromosomes during meiosis and Mendel's abstract laws, the chromosomal theory of inheritance was proposed long before there was any direct evidence that traits were carried on chromosomes. Critics pointed out that the individuals had far more independently segregation, segregating traits that had the chromosome. It was only after several years of carrying out crosses with the fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster, that Thomas Hunt Morgan provided experimental evidence to support the chromosomal theory of inheritance. Just look at the main points of the chromosomal theory of inheritance. Now, this theory states that during meiosis, homologous chromosomes pairs they migrate as discrete structures that are independent of other chromosome pairs, as we have seen that uh, during the uh, lectures that I did on meiosis. Second, the sorting of the chromosome from each homologous pair into pre gamete appears to be random. Each parent synthesizes gametes that contain only half of their chromosomal complement, half of the, their genetic material, as we had previously discussed during uh, the, discuss the lectures that we did on uh, mitosis and meiosis. And then, even though male and female gametes, which are sperms and eggs, differ in size and morphology, they have the same number of chromosomes, uh, suggesting equal genetic contribution from each parent. And the last point is that the gametic chromosomes uh, combine during the fertilization to produce offsprings with the same chromosome as their parents. Now, the observations that supported the chromosomal theory of inheritance include that chromosome like Mendel's genes came into homologous or we can also call them similar or matched pair in an organism. Now, for both genes and chromosome, one member of the pair comes from the mother and the other comes from the father. In this diagram on the left side, you can see pair genes, copies on an organism being represented by capital A and small a. Uh, one is from the mother and the other one is from the father. Second, paired homologous chromosome in the same organism, uh, one of which bears a, a, a dominant leaf, for example, capital A at a particular location which is called its locus and the other one which bears and alleles at the corresponding locus or location one homologue can come from the uh, organism's mother while the other comes from his father second point that is to be like uh, kept into mind is that the members of a homologous pair segregate or separate in meiosis so each sperm or egg or the gamete receives just one member the process mirrors segregation of alleles into gametes in uh, Mendel's law of segregation. In this diagram on the right side, you can see that segregation of the alleles into gametes where uh, capital A and small a organism produces gamete capital A and a gamete with the allele small a. And then you see the segregation of the chromosome into gametes during meiosis. One homologous chromosome bears a allele capital A while the other bears an allele small a at the corresponding location. And uh, during meiosis 1, the homologous chromosomes separate. And during meiosis 2, the chromatids of each homologous chromosome separate. Ultimately, four gametes are produced and uh, two contain a chromosome with a allele capital A and two contains a chromosome with an allele small a. The members of different chromosome pairs are sorted into gametes independently of one another in meiosis, just like the alleles of different genes in Mendel's law of independent assortment. Now, when we look at this diagram, you see that uh, how a uh, heterozygote, which has a uh, heterozygous individual who has uh, uh, gene uh, A and gene B, and it has um, 
you see the alleles capital A and small a and the capital B and small b is like proposed to make four equally common uh, gametes which may be capital A, capital B, capital A, small b, small a, capital B and uh, small a and small b and when they in genetics with um, uh, like you see it's following the same pattern. And second, the in, in, in you can also see that the independent assortment of the chromosome in the meiosis in which the, uh, the this diagram is depicting that the relationship between the chromosome configuration at meiosis 1 and the homologous segregation to gametes for two pairs of homologous chromosome. The larger chromosome pair bears uh, the um, capital A gene and the smaller chromosome pair bears the gene um, capital B gene. The organism it is uh, therefore heterozygous. So the larger homologous pair consists of one chromosome with an allele capital A and another allele with the small a, while the smaller homologue pair contains one chromosome with the allele capital B and the other with the allele small b. Now, if the homologous chromosomes bearing the uh, capital A and capital B alleles are positioned uh, in a way that one side of the of the metaphase plate, the homologues uh, bearing uh, the small a and small b alleles will be positioned uh, on the other side of the metaphase plate. And the capital A, capital B and the small a and small b gametes will be produced ultimately. So if on the other hand, the homologues bearing the capital A and small b alleles are positioned in a way that uh, on one side of the metaphase phase plate uh, and the homologues uh, bearing the uh, small a and capital B and on the other, capital A, small b and small a and capital B gametes will be ultimately produced. The chromosomal theory of inheritance was uh, proposed uh, before there was any direct evidence that the traits were carried on the chromosome and it was controversial at first. In the end, it was confirmed through the work of geneticist um, uh, Thomas uh, Morgan and his students who studied the genetics on fruit flies. In 1910, Thomas Hunt Morgan started his work with Drosophila melanogaster, which is a fruit fly. Well, first of all, he chose fruit flies because they can be like cultured or grown very easily and they're present in large numbers and they have like a uh, very short uh, generation time and have only four pair of chromosomes and that can be easily identified under the microscope as well. They have three pairs of autosomes, as you can see in this diagram, and a pair of sex chromosomes. Male flies have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome, so they are XY, while female flies have two X chromosomes, so they are XX. Morgan's crucial chromosome theory verifying experiments began when he found a mutation in a gene affecting the eye color of the fly. This mutation made a fly, um, fly's eye uh, white uh, rather than its normal red uh, color, which is red, and that's called the wild type color. At that time, he already knew that X and Y have to do something with the gender. Now, he used normal flies with red eyes and mutated flies with white eyes and crossed and bred them. Um, in flies, the white type eye color, which is the red one, uh, it was dominant and the white eye color uh, was uh, recessive. He was able to conclude that the genes for the eye color was on the X chromosome. It did not take Morgan long to realize that the eye color gene was being inherited in the same pattern as the X chromosome. Morgan found that the eye color uh, gene was inherited in different patterns by the males and female flies. And uh, this may have come as a surprise to Morgan, as I told you earlier, who had been a critic of the uh, chromosomal uh, theory of inheritance. Now, before we look at Morgan's experiment in detail in the form of a very nice uh, video lecture that I found online, let's just get yourself familiar with uh, some terms that will be used in the next uh, video. Uh, so these are, first of all, I think I told you all about that. First of all, autosomes, these are any chromosomes other than sex chromosomes. Then they will be using uh, the term um, hemizygous. Hemozygous are the individuals that have uh, single copies of the genes in uh, otherwise diploid cell or an organism. And then we have wild type. 
this is the typical form of an organism strain gene or a characteristic as it occurs in nature so let's look at Morgan's experiment in detail and also see how we can like develop a Punnett square for the um, inheritance of red eye color gene in Drosophila. You may recognize these tiny flies. Leave some fruit lying around and they quickly appear. These are fruit flies. Most of us consider these tiny insects to be a nuisance, but you may be surprised to learn that these common insects played a key role in one of the most important discoveries of the 20th century. A discovery that revealed an important fact about inherited traits and resulted in a Nobel Prize for its author, T.H. Morgan. In 1910, Morgan was working on one of the great mysteries of the day. How are traits, like eye color, passed from one generation of living things to the next. Here in the early 21st century, this question has been answered. We have a sophisticated understanding of genetics. But in 1910, there was much uncertainty about the details of inheritance. Morgan worked at Columbia University. His investigations focused on ideas developed by the 19th century monk Gregor Mendel, Mendel had spent years studying inherited traits in common peas. Traits like flower color and the structure of seeds. Patiently growing peas and controlling pollination, he demonstrated that there was a pattern to inheritance, a pattern that suggested traits were not a blend of traits from the parents, but in fact a distinct inheritance of a specific trait, a novel idea. Mendel had discovered genes but his discovery was largely ignored. By the early 1900s, some scientists were revisiting Mendel's ideas, Morgan among them. One of the frustrations with studying inheritance is the long time it takes to produce a new generation of most living things. Human beings have a gestation period of nine months, an elephant almost two years, and even peas can take months to mature meaning it takes years to study a meaningful number of generations. Morgan needed a subject for his investigations that would quickly produce new generations. He settled on the fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster. The life cycle of this tiny red-eyed fly, from egg to adult, can take as little as 10 days, an ideal candidate for studying inheritance. Morgan needed to identify unique traits or mutations among the population of fruit flies, mutations that could be tracked through generations. Heritable traits were hard to find. The team spent years looking at everything from subtle differences in wing shape to the location of body hair. In 1910, a dramatic mutation appeared. Walking among the colony of red-eyed flies was a white-eyed male. The single male fruit fly became the main player in one of the most important genetics experiments of the 20th century. The male Drosophila can be distinguished from the female by the very dark tip of its abdomen and the black comb on its front legs. The team in the fly lab at Columbia mated this white-eyed male with a red-eyed female. Interestingly, the first generation of offspring from this mating all had red eyes. The white-eyed trait had disappeared. Morgan suspected that the trait had not actually disappeared because Mendel had demonstrated that some traits are recessive and will reappear in a subsequent generation. Mating male and female flies from this first generation confirmed Morgan's suspicion. Approximately one half of the male flies of this second generation had white eyes, but only the males. All the female flies had red eyes. Morgan had a theory about these results. About the same time that he was doing his work, other scientists had established the presence of X and Y chromosomes chromosomes responsible for sex determination. Females carry two X chromosomes, male one X and one Y. 
Morgan proposed that a gene responsible for eye color was carried on the X chromosome, with the gene for red eyes being dominant and the gene for white eyes recessive. The mutant white-eyed male with a single X chromosome carried the recessive gene for white eyes. His Y chromosome had no control over eye color, so this male has white eyes. Scientists call the pure red-eyed Drosophila a wild type. When the white-eyed male mates with a wild type female, there are four possible outcomes. You may remember from high school biology the possible combinations of chromosome sharing as represented by this diagram, called a Punnett square. Let's look at mating a white-eyed male with a red-eyed wild-type female. This represents our white-eyed male with an X and Y chromosome. The X carries the recessive white-eyed trait, indicated by the lowercase w. The Y chromosome has no effect on eye color. This represents the red-eyed wild-type female. She carries two X chromosomes. Both carry the dominant red-eyed trait, as represented by the uppercase R. Let's start combining chromosomes. This combination produces this. This combination this. Then this one. And finally this. Note that every combination carries at least one dominant red-eyed gene. The white-eyed gene is repressed. All of this first generation will have red eyes. This is what Morgan observed. Note that both females on this diagram carry a recessive gene for white eyes. We will label this generation F1. Our Punnett square shows four flies but there will actually be numerous flies in this F1 generation. The female Drosophila lays hundreds of eggs. Let's look at mating a red-eyed male with a red-eyed female, both from this first generation, F1. The Punnett square looks like this. Remember the female flies from F1 each carry the recessive white-eyed trait on one of their X chromosomes. This time, the white-eyed trait returned in one-half of the male flies. Mating a white-eyed male fly with one of the females from the first or F1 generation results in white-eyed females. I'll let you finish the Punnett square to confirm that. Discovering the relationship between the X and Y chromosomes and inherited traits is a pivotal discovery. Among other things, it explains why the prevalence of some diseases or disorders is different for men and women. Traits like color blindness and afflictions like hemophilia are tied to genes on the X chromosome. In 1933, Morgan was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology. The award read, for his discoveries concerning the role played by the chromosome in heredity. So the main key takeaways from the chromosomal theory of inheritance and the experiment performed by T.H. Morgan are homologous chromosome pairs are independent of other chromosome pairs. Chromosomes from each homologous pair are sorted randomly into pre-gametes. Parents synthesize gametes that contain only half of their chromosomes. Eggs and sperms have the same number of chromosomes. Gametic chromosome combined during fertilization to produce offspring with the same chromosome number as their parents. For the experiment that, that was performed by T.H. Morgan, eye color in fruit flies was the first X-linked trait to be discovered. Thus, Morgan's experiment with fruit flies solidified the chromosomal theory of inheritance.